basically, you know, all of us, I don't care who you are, but especially people of color, we wear masks in the work environment, in a corporate environment, in any work environment. In other words, we come in, we assimilate, or we don't, they say, bring your authentic self, but yeah, y'all couldn't handle it. So we only bring about 60% of it because we know the other 40%, either we're going to be boxed in with stereotypes or it's going to be responded to in a negative way. And so we wear those masks and so do other people, other people being like some of the ones who are coming out totally against DEI, some who want to take us back in time, you know, and and not see a person that looks like me standing in front of the room telling them how they need to behave in the workplace. And so those folks are unmasking and getting very, very comfortable with saying the quiet parts out loud. We'll discuss race and how it plays a factor and how we didn't even talk about this topic because we were afraid. A Black Executive Perspective. Welcome to a Black Executive Perspective podcast, a safe space where we discuss all matters related to race, especially race in corporate America. I'm your host, Tony Tidbit. In recent years, There has been an alarming trend towards the more blatant display of racism and other prejudiced behaviors in the workplace, with individuals becoming increasingly bold in expressing their biases. Today's episode shines a light on the phenomenon called unmasking, where conversations and attitudes once hidden in the shadows are now being openly voiced. Our guest today, Rhonda Height, president and founder of Less Talk, will unpack the reasons behind this shift, assess its effects on professionals of color, and discuss effective ways to deal with and counteract these disturbing developments. She will also provide valuable insights and propose actionable solutions to combat this worrisome trend. Rhonda C. Height is a dynamic president and founder of Let's Talk, an innovative human resource consulting firm based in Atlanta, known for its educational, emotional intelligent presentations, training programs, and coaching services that aim to elevate careers and businesses. Hailing from Detroit, Michigan, the 313, and now calling Atlanta, Georgia her home, Rhonda is deeply committed to making a meaningful impact with her dash. And for those who don't know, it's when you were born and the day you pass away, that dash in the middle. With a rich background in human resources, she has devoted her career to assisting organizations and leaders in fostering respectful workplace environments. Outside of her professional endeavors, Rhonda is a devoted mother to her 10-year-old son, Brayden, and enjoys, enjoys indulging in reading, dancing, and adult coloring books to relax and recharge. Rhonda, welcome to A Black Executive Perspective, my sister. Thank you, Tony. I do need to I mean, one fact. Brayden is my grandson. <laughs> oh, gra- okay. I'm I sorry. So you, to, to him, you, but I do okay. have a son and adult son, Marcel. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, appreciate that. Well, yeah, so, I have a 10-year-old right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm, I'm pretty sure you spoil Brayden, uh, Brayden yeah. as being his grandmother. Is that correct? That is correct. That is awesome. Okay, well, awesome. And now, real quick, before we dive in into the unmasking part, tell us a little bit about your family and and your and, and what you're doing down in Atlanta. Okay, as you said, I hail from Detroit. I actually uh, ran away uh, uh, a long time ago, about thirty some years ago, uh, just for a fresh start. Some things that were happening in in my life that. Uh, were not good and probably had me on a path that would uh, really have changed uh, the trajectory, if you will, of my life and grieving the loss of my mom, who was the first major loss I ever experienced. And so came here with a neighbor on vacation and here being Atlanta and just felt peace, right? 
So I said, okay, I'm out. And within 30 days after that visit, here I was, you know. And so I am an honorary Atlanta peach now. I'm also a matriarch. Um, some call me a survivor because all of my, with the exception of uh, my sister's children and their grandchildren and my son and grandchild, all of my immediate family is no longer here on earth with us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a matriarch for a bunch of uh, five nieces and nephews and about 15 great nieces and nephews. Wow. <laughs> so that could be daunting at times, but yeah, it is a role that. Well, listen, you, so number one, that is, you know, sorry about your loss with your family. Thank you. um, definitely understand how sometimes it's best to, to move on and go somewhere and get a fresh start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing is you look awesome Thank you. to have, you know, that, that matriarch um, um, standpoint where you have so many family members underneath you. That is awesome. That's a blessing uh, right off the bat, right? So, you know, whatever you're doing, you keep doing it, okay? Because you're looking awesome. Well, thank you. And, you know, one thing, I'm from Detroit as well. Mm -hmm. I was born and raised. So where did you live on, in, in, in the city? Inside. You the east side, raised, right? Okay. Uh, near Mack and Van Dyke, if you're familiar with that area. So mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that was home for me. You know, we were there all of my life that I can recall. Uh, although I didn't go to school in the neighborhood there, I went to Cass Tech. My mom, in her infinite wisdom, uh, <laughs> against my wishes, applied for me to attend there. You know, I wanted to go to Murray Wright, which was more of a uh, vocational type school, um, mm -hmm. but she sent me there to CAS, and although I didn't like it, and I, and I still can't say, oh, I just love the, you know, being there. In hindsight, it was a great decision on her part, and it was really my first experience with diversity in people, mm. right? So it started preparing me, I guess, for some of the work that I do. So I, I thank you, mom. <laughs> No, and look, our mothers, uh, fathers, siblings, um, you know, they, they, you know, provide wisdom and, and to us. A lot of times we don't understand it at that point to your, like you were saying, but when we look back, we're like, I was, I was, I'm, I wasn't even thinking, I'm glad she did this or told me, or he told me about this. So it's very important. Absolutely. Now, one thing I want to back up on though, because you said, and look, I went to Cody High School and Henry Ford High School. I grew up on the west side of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, and Cass Tech, you know, that's where all the smart people went, all right? right Just for right. the audience so you guys know that. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't get in, all right? I, I, I could have been a janitor, but they wouldn't let me in to go to the classes, okay? Um, but you just said that that was the first time you dealt with diversity. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, because prior to that, every one that I dealt with looked like me. You know, we lived in the inner city. Um, so, of course, in the school system, all of the students were black. You know, we had the occasional white person. They were more of the token, if you will. But mm -hmm. I had not personally or even in the education system really had interactions with or developed relationships with people that were not black. And at CAS, it was this melting pot of individuals, all kinds of nationalities, you know, and the different races and the, uh, even amongst the teaching staff. And so that was my first time really having one-on-one -on -one interactions or getting to know as people, folks that mm -hmm. look different from myself. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And that kind of makes sense, you know, growing up on the east side. So, yeah, but definitely thanks for sharing that. That is awesome. And look, look where you are today. So, you know, I want to dive into, you know, your business, Let's Talk, and then we're going to talk about this phenomenon, unmasking. But before we go there, listen, you've been very successful. Obviously, you had some tragedy up in uh, the 313, but you moved down to Atlanta and you, like you said, you're now a, 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 a Georgia peach, uh, adopted Georgia peach, Motown I think. Peach. Uh, Motown peach. All right. That's cool. <laughs> but then you started a business and it, it's, it's thriving and you're doing well. Um, so we, and you're taught, you're, you're helping people be able to 
take their careers to the next level, um, and make their businesses more profitable and, and more attractive to consumers. So we, we definitely want to talk about that. So Rhonda, why did you want to come on a Black Executive Perspective podcast to talk about this topic? Because I want to share this information with folks out there, especially individuals that look like us that are navigating this in their workplaces every day. Got it. Got it. Well, you're on the right place to be able to do that. So are you ready to have this conversation, yes, Rhonda? Sure All right, let's talk about it. So before we get into the unmasking phenomenon, let, you're doing a lot of great work um, in Atlanta with individuals and companies. So tell us a little bit about Let's Talk. Okay. Well, I started Let's Talk while working for the Coca-Cola company here in Atlanta. It was a side gig, if you will, for the first two years. And what brought it about, actually, you know, T.D. Jake says this sermon of falling into the place. And I was a member of Coca-Cola's Toastmasters Club. And I started being, and I'm going to use the term pimped out, by my employer to go on the road and do presentations for their clients, uh, particularly fountain sales clients, and wasn't getting paid any extra money and still expected to do my nine to five job. And so I was on the road, I believe in St. Louis, and there was another speaker that was on the program with me. And he was a, a white guy and he says, this is the easiest 3000 I ever made. And he had only spoke for 30 minutes. And I was like, huh? So I'm thinking, yeah, you're on the wrong side of this check. So, <laughs> so started the business, if you will. Um, and, and so that was part of it, not just money motivated. But the other thing is, as an HR person, I really, when people say, why did you go into HR? Because you want to help people. I really did. But what I found out that is a large part of my job is protecting the company's assets. Right. And if you can help people along the way, that's great. And I started, you know, it's one thing to be in organizations and think certain things occur. It's another to have be in the middle of it because your job now makes you complicit. And when it got to the point that I could no longer reconcile my conscience and spirit with some of the things that I had to be in a part of or some of the things I had to overlook and remain silent about, you know, I said, OK, it's time for me to make a move. So I started Let's Talk, uh, did it on the side, quietly start building a client base and setting the foundation for the company. Um, and two years, excuse me, two years later, I tendered my resignation. And so while the company celebrated its 30th anniversary in, in December, I've only been doing it full time for 28 years uh, at this point. So. I really wanted to be able to be a change agent in the space. And I knew that I could do that better if I was in it, but not of it. Got it. Got it. So look, I got to back up a little bit because you're definitely from Detroit. <laughs> All right, so you got pimped out. <laughs> so, and I know that, I know that phrase and I know exactly what you mean. Right. And I think a lot of people, our audience uh, will know what that means too, because it happens to a lot of people. So, Let's, 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 so in terms of the, you've been in, in HR for a long period of time, you decided, Hey, look, and you know, the company, I'm basically not really helping the organ, the people in the organization. I'm really protecting the company. So there is a conflict of interest because a lot of times people think that they can go to HR and HR is going to help solve these problems in terms of conflict or what the case may be. But at the end of the day, HR is really about protecting the company and making sure that the company is, is a shield for the company and making sure that the company doesn't get sued or whatever the case may be. Is that that's what I'm hearing? Yeah. And I don't want to say that there's not opportunity to sincerely help people. Mm -hmm. But if you are at a crossroads where it's OK, I can do this and it will help this individual. Mm -hmm. but it could harm the company, then definitely you got to fall on the side of the organization because, you know, it's like serving two masters, at least for me. Now, other HR mm -hmm. professionals may feel differently, but I always felt as though I was serving two masters and, you know, I knew which side signed the front of the check, which is why I said, let me get out. So, I mean, you know, so I can sign the front of the checks. <laughs> no. 
And look, that took a lot of courage, I would imagine, to do that, right? So tell us a little bit about some of the services that you provide and how you help people in terms of building up their their personal assets as well as making their business more profitable. Well, our primary service is in the learning and organizational development space in terms of instructional design and actual delivery and facilitation of learning workshops. Um, Of course, the whole DEI is a space that that we land in, but we also do a lot in the way of leadership development and interpersonal communication skills. Uh, Over the years, I've touched on a few other topics, but those are my three uh, niche areas, if you will. As a registered corporate coach, I work to coach leaders, uh, those in the C-suite and below, as well as help uh, set up self-directed work, you know, coaching groups and organizations, um, you know, and the speaker. So I'm often hired as a speaker for different events. So those are the three buckets that I primarily work in over the years. Of course, I've done other stuff like just help organizations, small businesses put together employee handbooks, uh, write or update and align policies with legally what's going on or any changes in that area and other type projects. But those first three, those are my sweet spots. And um, those are the areas that I've done the most work in. Got it. And when you talk about interpersonal skills, what's some of the themes that you see that people come to you that they need help on? Just being able to talk to folks. (laughs) As simplistic (laughs) as that sounds, they don't know how to talk to folks, some people. And it's not just because they're introverts, which obviously sometimes that's an aspect of it, but just understanding or being able to have a certain level of emotional intelligence to know when to say something, when not, and or either how to uh, reframe handling conflict. That's always been a big one, dealing with conflict. And uh, so those are the areas primarily and just really understanding their primary communication styles. I use a couple of assessment tools to help them with that because you can't manage what you're not aware of, right? And you also have to you know, talk a little bit about the willingness to be flexible and modify your communications for effectiveness based on who you're talking to, what you're trying to accomplish, or the environment that you're in. So those are aspects that we work with individuals on and trying to get them to be able to express themselves a little better (laughs) in the workplace. Wow, that is awesome. And and just so I'm clear here, you've been, how long you've been an HR professional? Ooh, okay. You're going to make me reveal my age. My first, <laughs> my <laughs> very first job me. in HR was in 1982. Okay. Okay. And All right. so, so, and I've worked in addition to the Coca-Cola company, I was an arbitrator for Sinai Hospital. You might remember Sinai over there on the yep, side in Detroit. of town, the yep, west side. Yep. Uh, and prior to that, in the job that I was in before coming here, was with the Federal Reserve Bank, the Detroit branch. And Mm -hmm. the first job in HR was with the Rehabilitation Institute over there in the medical center. So I've, you know, worked with various organizations, but all in some facet of HR and all primarily in the employee relations realm. I don't deal with compensation and benefits. I worked in recruiting for a short amount of time, hated it. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that's kind of has, has been the, the, uh, journey, I guess. Okay. No, no, that's good though. So, so you've, you've been doing this for a while. Yes, you've worked with a lot of companies. You've seen, you have a lot of experience in terms of the inner workings with companies in terms of their leadership, um, how their employees interact, employee benefits, you know, promotions or lack thereof, all those different things that happen within an organization, correct? Correct. So when it comes to leadership, what are some of the things that you see, again, common theme, that people come to you in leadership positions um, in terms of uh, trying to secure uh, your help? For the leaders, it's either expanding on their toolkit things that they don't necessarily have, particularly with those who were promoted into their roles, meaning that prior to that, they might have been individual contributors 
or at supervisory levels, and now they have more responsibility, but they're great at the job, they know the job, but they lack certain leadership skills. Um, and so a lot of the requests, especially with my coaching clients, that's what they're attempting to do, to build their toolbox as a leader. In some cases, I'm called in because leaders are behaving badly, uh, and they're more of the problem than the employees. And so mm -hmm. like a client I'm currently working with, the staff is great. The employees, they do what they need to do. There's not a lot of issue there. The issues in the organization are in the C-suite. And so, you know, they invited me to come in and try and work with these leaders to address some of the behaviors because some of the behaviors um, are on that borderline of illegal. And, mm. uh, and, if, and then again, you know, it's a risk management situation. So much of the work that I do, it's about educating, but it's also often risk management for the organizations mm. as well. Got it. Got it. And, and listen, you know, one of the things is that as being a leader um, and coming to you to get help in the areas that you just got finished talking about, um, typically people build up habits over a long period of time, right? And sometimes they're not even aware of those habits um, until it's made known to them. So based on that, what's the percentage of people that come for your coaching that are open to accepting feedback versus the ones that are like forced to come and, and they kind of listen a little bit and then they, they do their own thing. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I never thought of it in terms of percentage. And if I'm just looking at coaching clients alone, so let me, it's two buckets. The first would be the coaching clients with the coaching clients. I would say 90% of them are there because they want to be, they've sought me out or they've asked their organization for assistance. Then there's the 10% that the organization say, you're going to do this, <laughs> right? In a training environment, it's the, the, it reverses. In a training environment, I would say maybe 60 to 70% are open to the message and 30 to 40% like, I'm only here because they made me be here. I call them <laughs> prisoners, right? They're the prisoners in the classroom. They don't want to be there. The class is mandatory. They've been made to come. And so they walk in already to fight or either just shut down. What typically happens to the prisoners when they go back? Do they, you know, because they were sent for a reason, they okay? And and they come, but they're already like, I ain't doing it, yeah. <laughs> okay? So what typically happens to them, if you know, when they go back to their organization? A lot of times I don't know what happens okay. when they go back, but I can tell you what happens in the classroom, that 30 to 40% becomes 10 or 20 to 10%, right? Because it's a way that... You, you can deal with them and pull them in and I and not to blow my own horn, but I think I'm pretty good at that. And it's really just about finding that common human piece, right? For example, I had a guy we were the topic was sex harassment, sexual harassment. And we used a vignette, a video vignette. And he just was like, I don't see anything wrong. Everybody's overreacting. And he just gave her a compliment, even though the guy was like giving her the elevator eyes and <laughs> making comments about how she, he knows she's glad her, she's divorced and but, all this stuff. But he, he ain't do nothing wrong. Yeah, he didn't do nothing wrong. And she's just overreacting and we're too woke and all of this. And so I remembered him saying at the beginning when we did introductions that he had a daughter, a granddaughter. And so I said, you have a granddaughter, correct? I said, let's fast forward 20 years, put your granddaughter in this video, in this same situation on her job, where she's receiving compliments that she doesn't want, where she's being looked at like a, a steak and potato dinner, and you know, a couple of other things. I said, do you still see this situation the same way? Would it be okay? Would you tell your granddaughter, you know, don't be so sensitive? And he sat there and he looked and he just sat there for a minute. And then he said, you're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, I, he said, I'd be up there with my shotgun. I said, okay, I'm not going to co-sign that, but you get the point, right? You get the point. Right. And so one of the things I try to do is humanize, you know, bring that human element into it or find something about them. 
and and change the facts, massage it just a little bit, the message where it becomes more personal to them. And in doing that, sometimes they do have that light bulb moment and they're able to, you know, see it in a different way. And some are just hardcore. <laughs> I don't care what you do. That's where they're going to stay. But to be fair, though, yeah. they're they're gone anyway. Right. Yeah. And for you to be able to, you know, decrease that percentage, you know, the 30 to 40 percent who like, I, I'm not listening. I'm not interested. I didn't do anything wrong. I just got to check a box here and get them to engage. Yeah. That shows the talent that you have. And I can see why your company is doing so well. Plus, the other thing that I'm, I'm hearing out of this is that you really enjoy this. You really enjoy helping people, you know, um, take it to the next level. Is that correct? I do. I do. That, that, and when they have those light bulb moments or, and this is going to sound negative and, and I'm not sure how folks are going to take it, but one of the things I love about what I do is I can come in there and I can tell these bad actors things that the employees can't because I do sign on the front of checks, right? And I don't have to see you after this is over with. So I can, I can serve it up raw, you know, with a little finesse, obviously, in a way that employees can. And I got a good story on that one, but I don't want to rattle on. Yeah. No, no, no. All good though. However, let's do this because I love the way you just got finished saying how you cook. Okay. You can serve it up raw with some finesse. So why don't we dive into the unmasking part from a raw <laughs> and a finesse standpoint? All right. So just so everybody's on the same page, right? Uh -huh. When we say unmasking, what does that mean, Ron? Basically, you know, all of us, I don't care who you are, but especially people of color, we wear masks in the work environment, in a corporate environment, in any work environment. In other words, we come in, we assimilate, or we don't. They say, bring your authentic self, but yeah, y'all couldn't handle it. So we only bring about 60% of it because we know the other 40% either we're going to be boxed in with stereotypes or it's going to be responded to in a negative way. And so we wear those masks. And so do other people. Other people being like some of the ones who are coming out totally against DEI. Some who want to take us back in time, you know, and, and not see a person that looks like me standing in front of the room telling them how they need to behave in the workplace. And so those folks are unmasking and getting very, very comfortable with saying the quiet parts out loud. And when you say quiet parts out loud, like what do you mean? For example, I did a class um, several months ago and I was in a part of Alabama, I won't say where, <laughs> but I was in a part of Alabama, a part of Alabama I didn't feel comfortable in to begin with because there was no diversity there. I had kind of been warned of what was going on and everywhere I went, there were political signs and yards that let me know we are not the same. And so I'm at this facility and um, the guy comes in and he's like, what is this class about? So I'm you know, giving him the highlights of the class. Uh, I don't want to sit here and listen to this woke S, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. I said, well, it's a mandatory class. And if you leave today, they're just going to send you back and I don't want to see you again. I know you don't want to see me again. So let's just do this. And during the class, he kept interjecting. There was an exercise and one of the characters in the exercise was of Indian descent, you know, and oh, you got terrorists and you know, y'all putting terrorists in these videos. I mean, he was just like going and then mm -hmm. his friends start, you know, kind of chiming in and other people making inappropriate comments. So that's an example of what I mean by unmasking and saying the, the quiet part out loud. Whereas right. in years back, they might have thought that, but in that environment, they were not going to speak it. Let me ask you this. So, um, you know, number one, I agree with you. We all wear masks. Okay. Flat out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're right. It, it, the ideal world is you could just show up who you are and everybody, but we know that's not fair. Mm -hmm. We know that's not going to happen. And then you're right when you said that, you know, we get reduced to stereotypes uh, or they can't handle our real self. OK, so we definitely mask up. And I and I think for the most part, and I love to hear your thoughts on this. I think most people mask up. All right. Because people have insecurities and all different type of things that they bring to work. 
But in terms of that situation that you just spoke about, <clears throat> you know, with that person 30 years ago, do you think based on his, his demeanor, his mindset, do you think that person still would have did that um, um, versus somebody who might have came in shy or came in like real friendly and, yeah, hey, Rhonda, how you doing? And then... You know, now because of things of, you know, the political climate and stuff like that, now all of a sudden, Joe, that you know, who always says, hey, Rhonda, here's a cup of coffee. And now he's like, why we got to do that? You know, so I love to hear your thoughts on that. I, you know, I think and I don't know, 30 years ago, probably 20 years ago. No. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe 30, maybe 30, not in that environment. You know, I could always tell, like when I first started out and started doing this work, you could tell who was, were not in alignment with what was being taught through their nonverbals, through their lack of participation, right? Now, okay, the nonverbals are not so nonverbal anymore. Mm. They're actually saying it. They are uh, initiating conversation around it through the questions that they ask. Mm. And these questions are typically posed as hypotheticals, but I have a feeling in some of the cases that it is not so hypothetical, which is mm -hmm. why I set a ground rule now. We're not going to talk company cases because they're trying to get their stuff out in this situation. So I definitely have seen a shift. And the thing for me is, is it better that they stay quiet? as opposed to come out, right? There's a, a conflict in how I look at it. On one hand, it's like, yeah, keep that stuff to yourself or keep it out, outdoors. Don't bring it into the work environment. But mm -hmm. then on the other hand, it's like, well, thank you for letting me know who you are so I can proceed accordingly. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a catch-22 situation, but definitely it has changed. Even in the last 10 years, it's changed. And I've seen it over and over again. Uh, when I go into these organizations where people are just much more comfortable with expressing things that they would not have previously. Mm. What's some of the, the, the trends you're seeing patterns in terms of them expressing, like what's the majority of the stuff? A lot of it is the talking points that we hear in the news. This is woke. You're trying to make me feel bad about myself. Um, this is a uh, affirmative action and we're really not talking affirmative action um questioning qualifications of people of color if y'all really want to be you know value you should get your jobs on merit i wouldn't want a job just because you know to and they make it very global they're not just mm -hmm. referring to an individual they're talking you know just holistically and again just the stuff that we're hearing uh, in the media and the news that we see on social media, if you I ever, if you ever go on Twitter now known as X, and see some of the comments that are made there, some of those comments are actually being made. Some of those conversations are actually being had in the work environment, and they're leading to things that are not cool. You know, I've had classes segregate themselves. We were at an organization, they were having a training at an offsite. And the reason we were invited there in the first place is because people were hanging nooses in the break rooms. Folks were showing up with their gun racks on their trucks, parked in the parking lot with their guns on them, their shotguns, whatever. Uh, you know, it was a lot of stuff going on. And so I'm already coming into the environment like, <laughs> <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. You ready to start throwing hands yeah. and stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't pack my piece because I had to fly to get there. Hold on, hold on. But, um, Wait a minute. It was you, 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 you. Huh? No, I got to say this. You ain't been gone from Detroit that long. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know, I'm a Georgia Pete. Me, don't you ain't a Georgia Pete. You, all right. You coming down ready to throw down. That's why right? I say no town that. Pete's because those roofs run deep. <laughs> they run deep. Yeah. But, you know, we were hearing all of this stuff. And we were in a town, and I hate to pick on Alabama, but it was Butler, Alabama, which is on the, the borderline of Mississippi. So, you know. And it was just it, that town was something else anyway. But so we're at this offsite location for this training, me and a colleague, white female. And my classroom was upstairs. Hers was down. 
So I'm noticing everybody coming into my class is black, which never happens, never happens. So I'm like, what's going on? So she comes upstairs maybe a few minutes before we're scheduled to get started. And she says, uh-huh, I thought so. Come here. I go down to her class. All the white people are in her class. All the black people have come upstairs with me. And she's like, what should we do? What should we do? And I'm like, I don't know. Is it our job to integrate them? I don't know. And we were scheduled to start like any minute. So we were so thrown by it. We didn't do anything. We just said, okay, let's proceed. So lunch comes because we were doing two classes, one in the a.m. and one in the afternoon. And I couldn't find her. I finally found her in the restroom crying. And I'm thinking, I'm asking, what's going on? What's wrong? And she says, these people, they're so horrible. And I said, what happened? She said, they came out on me. Basically, they were arguing with her about why they thought it was wrong that if they got, if they were out at a clan event, or they were seen with their robes that they could lose their jobs and why they felt these black people were coming in here taking their jobs and just all okay. And she was broke down with it. And that afternoon, I, well, she got it together. When we got ready to start the second set of classes, they did the same thing. And I said, you know what, we're going to count them all. So I made them count all and we integrated that day because it was just crazy. But the, the point is, I mean, you don't expect stuff like that to happen in the work environment. No, no. So wait, we got to back up for a second okay. because you you saying stuff in 2023 or 2022 or whatever what year this happened that, you know, stuff that goes back to the 1800s. OK, mm -hmm. which is insane. So, number one, what you are saying is the people are the trends you're seeing. They're repeating what they're hearing in the media, yeah. right? People here to replace you. Um, it's uh, w the woke. Um, they ain't qualified. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to take my job. Pretty much verbatim. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, some themes of that. When you asked about themes, those are themes, you know, that. Those are the themes, right? The themes. And then, and then now there, you, you went to a place where people bringing gun racks. Okay. And so stuff to that nature. Truck. On their truck. Yeah. I'm, yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is the environment. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, my, and now you, 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 you had a session where they, they segregated themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And where all the black people came to your class and all the white mm -hmm. people went to your colleague's class who is white. Mm -hmm. And then they went off on her. Okay. In terms of, you know, I can't believe the laws and I'm paraphrasing. I can't believe things. I'll lose my job. If I show up with my clan role, that's what I'm hearing. That's basically, basically what we're not show up like. at work, but like if they were discovered out or let's say the news out, out that, the at event. a bar or something like that. Right. Yeah. Or driving back from a clan meeting and they got pulled over yeah. and their, their yeah. hat was still on yeah. and people found out yeah. that they would lose their job. And they're like, that was wrong. It was unfair. It's unfair. Okay. <laughs> this is insane. So now let me ask you, <laughs> this is insane. So, and here's the things that most people don't even know this stuff is going on. So I'm glad that you came to share this. What is the leadership at these companies doing? I mean, some are just checking the box to say, hey, we're going to have this training. We're going to make it mandatory. We're going to make everybody go through it. Um, some are not. Some are doing a bit more than that. I'm happy to say that some are really committed to having inclusive and respectful workplaces. And so they go beyond the training in terms of looking at their policies. Um, but I think the biggest thing these organizations can do and where many fail is getting rid of the bad actors. Right? Do you see that? Yeah. Do you so see you them? You can do all the training you want. You can have all the policies in place. But if you are not getting rid of the individuals, because what happens is this behavior metastasizes. You got this this folk, this person or that person doing, and they say, oh, okay, no repercussions. They may get a slap on the hand, but no real repercussions. Then that then encourages Johnny and Karen mm -hmm. <laughs> to ratchet up their stuff too. And before mm -hmm. you know it, it's a culture. It right, has integrated right. itself fully into the culture of that organization. And sometimes, and this is me saying this, I don't know this for a fact, and I've never had this conversation with a leader, but sometimes I believe that the leadership, they hold these opinions and these ideologies themselves. And that is why they're not more assertive in really rooting this stuff out and taking 
care of it, but they do the surface stuff because they understand optics and they understand the effect on their brand from optics. So, right. I, and that's, again, not all organizations. I can't even honestly say it's the majority, but definitely right. there are some that I think the leadership, they co-sign the behavior. They may not engage in it openly because of the roles they hold and they understand what comes with that. But I think their lack of follow up, their lack of doing things to try and sustain uh, what they hope to get from these training programs is an indication of where they lie with it. Two quick questions. Number one, in, in terms of that example that you provided, and, and maybe there's others, were there leaders and that were, were some of them leaders that was, you know, a very, you know, uh, uh, gregarious in terms of their outwardness, uh, in terms of these racial tropes and stuff of that nature? The examples that I've just given you did not involve leaders. Those were employees. Okay. But Got it. I had a situation where I was with the entire C-suite for an organization from the CEO on down, all of them, CFO, everybody, the general counsel, everybody. And um, they, it was... How can I put it? It was probably one of the most impactful professional experiences that I've had with that and being able to kind of turn the moment, if you will, this particular organization. And I was brought in by a colleague. It was actually her client. Um, and she wanted me as backup in the situation. And now I see why. So generally, before I go into an organization, I do my research. And I went to their website and I always look at the leadership, you know, because that tells me something about it. If I look and I see no diversity, OK, I mm. kind of got some insight, not fully. In this case, there was none. All white men, with the exception of two white females, and they were in the positions you would think they would be in HR and marketing. Right. Mm hmm. And then I looked at their website because I always check to see what are their stance or their position um, on diversity, equity, inclusion. Do they have anything along that line? You know, that kind of stuff. There was nothing. Then I look at the jobs that are available. And I typically look just so I have an idea of the type of roles that are part of that organization. But something I saw in this case, there were over 200 job openings at this organization. 200. Over 200. So okay. we get there for the, and I'm already walking in, um, and this was during the whole when George, the racial reckoning was going on. So it was kind so of- So 2020, 2020, 2021? Gotcha. And we had just started back. In fact, it was the first live training I had did since the pandemic. And we go in and I had my braids <laughs> and I was a little nervous. I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to be put in a box with these braids, but go in and the- uh, chief financial officer, he immediately tries to railroad it by talking about millennials and his nephew and a lot of stereotypes around that and this and this and this. And my colleague, she was at the front of the room. He just took over like, you know, forget you woman and just kind of took over. And I had to step in. I don't remember exactly what I said because he kept saying, and can this course do this? And this course can't do that. And are y'all going to teach us? You know, he was just and just being arbitrary and coming with all and this. this was, huh? yes, I'm good. Was this your colleague or is this? Was... She was my colleague and she asked me to co-facilitate this program with her. Got it. Right? She got thought it, it would it. be good to have this melanin in the room. Got it. Right? Got, right? It, got to, it. Got it. Like an example, because she knew, yeah, what, yeah, she yeah. knew what they were about. Right. Exactly. exactly. And, uh, and probably also to have her back <laughs> a little bit. So as he's going on and we hadn't even got to the agenda yet. He just totally hijacked the course from her. And so I finally said, well, if you would allow us to do our jobs and get to why we're here, we'll be able to respond to some of those things. So we get on track, we get on, and I'm getting all these stare these comments. The CFO sat there and said how he wasn't going to hire anybody that said they would want it work-life balance, you know, 
If they won't work, that's an automatic, no, I don't even want to talk to them if you can. And then an, uh, another C-suite executive made a comment about women. Then another one said something about, you know, certain folks don't want to work. And then another one said something about they need to know the, if the English is not their first language, it's difficult to work because you can't understand. Just all this stuff from the C-suite. They're just going off. They're going the off. They're just going the off. This is C-suite. The CEO, he just <laughs> kind of... <laughs> You know, sitting back now. He hasn't said anything, but you haven't checked your people. Are you? He ain't checking them though. Yeah. He ain't checking right. them. He, he ain't saying, guys, this either. is wrong. What are you doing? Don't speak that way. This is disrespect. He not. He just sitting back, just letting them roll. Is that what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So you know, my colleague gets through her piece, and it's time for me to get in the front of the room. And and I'm been sitting back taking notes and all of this stuff. So I get up there, and the piece that I was covering dealt with psychological safety in the work environment. And so I'm, I'm not even into it good. And the general counsel says, if they, I don't even understand that. If they don't feel safe, that's their problem. It's not our job to make them feel safe. And I said, obviously, I said, because I don't feel psychologically safe in this room right now. Plus, they have 200 openings, yeah. so I can see why. Wait, wait for it, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, so wait a minute. So then the CEO, he pipes up. He said, you don't. He said, why is that? I said, well, number one, I'm a woman of color in a room that is, uh, you know, I don't see anybody that looks like me. Number two, you all, the way that you kind of came at my colleague this morning and disrespected her and hijacked it with a lot of stereotypical comments and trope. I said, number three, when I went to your website, which is what I do as part of research, I looked, I saw no diversity in your in your leadership here. I saw nothing on the website saying that you all even support diversity, equity, inclusion. I said, and then this, and I picked up my phone and I had a tab and I started scrolling. I said, you all have over 200 something <laughs> job openings. <laughs> I said, so you put those things together? Yeah, no, I do not feel psychologically safe here. And right, they were right. just like, wow. And my colleague got so nervous about it. She tried to change it. Well, let's do an exercise. An exercise that had nothing to do with what we were doing. She was trying to kill time to lunch. And of course, you know, the day kept going. And I was just using their stuff back because they came and they were like, we make decisions about people's lives because they provide medical equipment for a certain medical issue, which happens to be diabetes. Who does that primarily affect? Brown and black people, right? People. Yeah, so exactly. the CSC, mm -hmm. the general counsel, we make important decisions in these rooms that affect our client lives. I said, but yet there's nobody in this room that even looks like the clients that you serve. So really, how effective are the decisions you're making? Because they're based on assumptions and based on what I've heard today, probably a whole lot of bias. You could have heard. What did they say to that? Leon Cott. <laughs> I mean, I just, I was loving that day. And this is what I mean about I get to go in and I get to say what others can't say to them, right? right. What they need to hear. Long story short, we got through the day. They kind of piped down, except for this, the little Mark and Chief Mark, or what he wasn't Mark, I forget his role, because he just kind of, the one who originally hijacked it, he just kind of, you right. know, for the rest of the day. Okay, cool. Psh, tune you out. Let me do what I do, what I came here to do. And at the end of the day, the CEO, he said, thank you. He said, I'm looking around this room and I handpicked everybody in here. He said, and I know you're not going to believe it, but I really do believe in diversity. I really do believe that it's a good business initiative. He said, but I can see based on the people I've selected that my actions don't align with what I think. And he said, thank wow. you for wow. shedding a light on that. So that wow. was, it ended well, but yeah. So, you know, it happens at, at, the, at the top levels as well. Did any, any, like, um, any um, feedback on that company, you know, three, four years later, did they make any changes if you know of anything like I that? I have not uh, heard anything. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't hear anything about what happened after that day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so and I've not gone back to look to see how many job openings they currently have. And we were invited by the chief HR officer and she her concern outside of the fact that the company was not really embracing 
uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion was she felt those 200 and something job openings, which she was able to name by heart in that meeting, were an indication of the culture there. Mm-hmm. And so well, whether or not other things have happened or they've gotten better, I really don't know. I never received any feedback from my colleague. I know on the way to the airport, she just kept thanking me. Thank you. Thank you for the courage because it was, I won't say she was intimidated by it all, but it was overwhelming for her. And she was afraid to speak truth to power. In that moment, mm-hmm. she still wanted to kind of kowtow and tap dance around it. But I'm like, you know what? They took the gloves off first, so let's rock. No, and I'm <laughs> glad you did that. But to be fair, I can definitely see that being special. Well, look, you know, there's, you know, I can see that being in, in, intimidating, um, especially if you haven't dealt with stuff like that before, where, you know, people of color have dealt with maybe not to that level in terms of a raucous crowd especially a c-suite leaders but we dealt with stuff like that before so i I can definitely see her being intimidated but in terms of psychological safety how does this affect the people of color that work at these organizations a lot of times negatively right because and there are studies that show that people of color um have an extra layer when it comes to psychological safety I mean, that goes back to that when they say, be your authentic self and we want the diversity. Yeah, not really. You may want it, but can you handle it is the question. And because for many of us, we know that they can't handle it. You know, we still will keep the mask on, if you will, to a certain degree, or we will assimilate um, or some overreact, meaning that they go above and beyond to reduce the feeling of threat that some in the workplace, you know, may experience. And yeah, earlier in my career, I did that. I said, like, mm. I wouldn't wear braids. I wouldn't wear big jewelry. I wouldn't, you know, make sure that I didn't drop a vowel or, <laughs> or a letter and a word. Um, and a lot of that is because they don't feel safe and we want to dodge stereotypes we know that because i know if i show up and i talk maybe in the way that i've talked with you at certain points in our conversation today oh she's ghetto oh she yes, yes oh she's yes and then they will start questioning you know my intellect perhaps she's not mm-hmm. as smart as we thought she was maybe you know she's not this if i come dressed a certain way Right. Even though they could be sitting there in wrinkled jeans and a, and a T-shirt with letters missing and still be considered credible. If I show up in anything even close to that or anything that represents my culture, then my credibility is called into question. And so how can you feel safe in environments right. where you know that just being who you are or expressing parts of your culture will have you typecast? or labeled, Mm. or that it could in some way obstruct or hinder your career path, right? Mm. So I think that there's, and especially when you're in situations where you're the only, Mm. that feeling of uh, not being safe is heightened. There's no question. Because it's like, okay, there's nobody here. And I don't think that individuals who have never been in that situation understand just how uncomfortable a place, you know, that is, even on an international level, I was in Germany two weeks ago with a group of cohorts, and I was the only U.S. citizen. I was also the only person of color, well, black, only black person. We had people from all over the place, and they kept asking me all of these questions, and how, well, what about this, and what do you think of that, and how is, and in my mind, and they were lovely people, so let me they were friends. I right, totally right. enjoyed my time with them. Right. They were I friends. learned a lot from them. We laughed a lot. Great group of people, a great experience. But I wondered at one point when I seemed to be a focus for everybody. Everybody wanted to talk to Rhonda. Everybody wanted to touch Rhonda, right? And I said, is this because I'm an American or is it because I'm black or 
you know, what what what's the interest here? Why am I such a person of interest in this multinational group? And that's part of what affects our psychological safety. When certain behaviors, even though they may be innocent in nature, and they may not even be harmful or malicious, but always having that question in your mind, is this related in some way to who I am? And yes. if you don't have to live your life asking those questions with any type of regularity, I don't think people can understand just how unsafe these psychologically unsafe these work environments can feel. What can companies do to protect their employees? Since now, to your point, you know, this trend, this unmasking is becoming more prevalent um, in a lot of companies, right? Uh, and, and you're saying that a lot of, not all the time, but a lot of the stuff that people are saying is stuff that they're be, they're repeating that they hear in the media. Mm -hmm. So, and the media is, is, is global. The media is, is, and let's just keep it to the United States. The media is like all across the country, right? So a lot of those messages are going, you know, North, South, East, and West. Mm -hmm. So what can companies do to protect their employees from a leadership standpoint when it comes to unmasking? That's a good question. And it takes time because they have to develop and sustain cultures that support mutual respect for the individual, that support diversity. And I don't mean just in the things that we see, the way mm -hmm. that people go about doing the work, the way that they problem solve, they collaborate, they you know, because diversity is so much more than the surface stuff. And that's one thing, expand that conversation, um, provide appropriate training, have policies that support the culture that they're trying to have, because that's the issue. An organization's culture, they can do everything right. They can have all the policies, they can have all the training, all the messaging, all the branding. But if there are unwritten rules and accepted behaviors that create a toxic culture, none of that stuff is going to matter. It's not going to protect employees or make them feel psychologically safe or in some cases even physically safe, right? right. They have a culture where bullying behavior is accepted. The Department of Labor has a ton of statistics where abusive and bullying behavior in the workplace has led to actual violence, right? So I think you need leadership that is not just willing to talk about it, but be about it. Leadership that is willing to have a hard conversations because this stuff is not easy. It is not mm -hmm. easy to talk about, even for myself, a person who this is my life's work. And mm -hmm. I still am in environments at times where it's a hard conversation to have, um, mm -hmm. where they you know, have policies and take action that support that kind of thing. And it has to be from the very top. And that top person has to hold his leader, the, the leaders that report to him or her. Let me not be, you know, mm -hmm. right. Him or her, leader, right. That report mm -hmm. to him or her to hold them accountable as well. I think making it a part of the performance evaluation process where, because this stuff is measurable, you can measure it, right? Mm -hmm. So making it a part of that process so there is a level of accountability around it where people know, oh, they're not just saying this, they really mean this and this could affect my money, my rating, you know, my ability to, to move forward or upward in the organization. And so it's it's a plethora of things that have to happen, but it has to start at the top and it has to be supported at the top and it has to be consistent. We can't do it in February only. Right yeah, or right. March only, or any other yeah. months, if you will, you know, right, it has right. to be consistent. consistent. And it has to be authentic. Doing it because it's you know, it's it looks good, or doing it because it's expected. What's that? You know, if if I'm a uh, employee at a company dealing with unmasking, mm -hmm. what recommendations would you give me in terms of how to deal with it? So the first tip I would have is not to engage in those conversations. If someone, you know, makes those statements, if they, you know, they try to engage you in conversations on politics, and this is old school, we know that, but never in my lifetime have I seen things so divisive and it's 
and so much hate and rhetoric being a part of it, right? But just don't engage. If the behavior is egregious um, or something that impacts your ability to do your job, then report it, speak up, you know, utilize your internal mechanisms for raising concerns and complaints. And yes, it takes courage to do so because there's a fear of retaliation, even and typically not so much from above, but from peers, you know, being ostracized, left out of communications. But you got to have the courage to speak up um, when these things happen or to walk away and not engage. The second is, in the words of Lead Belly, stay woke, which that term has been misappropriated. By yes. And they don't really understand the history. Has. But for those who don't, who might be listening to the podcast, Lead Belly is the first documented person to use that term. And he used it to people who were leaving his shows in sundown towns. And sundown towns are the towns where people that look like me had to be off the streets but before the sun went down or you were a potential bait. Right. Right. And so when I say stay woke, be aware of what's going on um, and in your organization. I'm talking about obviously the world, but in your organization, be aware of what's going on. Know the unwritten rules. Know, uh, you know, the, the players, if you will, just having knowledge, because many times people get caught off guard. They get in there, they get complacent, they get comfortable. Oh, they accept me, they love me. They start bringing their trinkets into the office and the next thing you know, you, you're in a situation, right? You got so, got. Yes, <laughs> stay woke, don't get comfortable, don't get complacent um, in that. And then I would also say, you know, be true to yourself. Don't feel that you have to compromise your values for that paycheck because there are remedies outside an organization if the types of behaviors that you're being subjected to are, are above and beyond or violations of law or policy. You don't have to, to, to take it, if you will. Um, and I'm not suggesting everybody run out to the EEOC, but just know that you got options and, mm. um, and, I always remind myself that it's more about who they are than I am, because a lot of times when these folks are expressing these unpopular opinions or these negative ideologies, it feels very personal. And it's mm. not. That's their mm. baggage. Like I say in my book, take the lessons and leave the baggage. Right. It is not your bag to carry. And and just, you know, remember that because that will help you in determining how do I navigate this here? It's not personal. This is just a person that I need to avoid in the work environment, or is this behave, person's behavior at a level that I need to speak up? Right, um, right. So those are a few things that I, I would say, you know, mm -hmm. and when in doubt, I always, this is a tip I give to my coaches and I say in time, Listen with curiosity because it's possible to be too sensitive to this stuff as well. And I've had to learn to do that. When some of the comments are made, they're not being malicious, right? It's not coming from a negative place of intent, although mm -hmm. the impact of it may feel negative for you. So I, I say, listen with curiosity and before reacting, ask questions so that you can be sure what you're responding to is definitely what they're saying or where they're coming from or what their actions are, are saying versus responding to the emotional impact mm -hmm. or the psychological impact um, that it, it has you know, had on you. Rhonda, my girl, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this topic, your expertise, your passion, your experience with a Black Executive Perspective podcast. This was awesome. I learned a lot. So let me ask you this. How can a Black Executive Perspective podcast help you, Rhonda? Well, I mean, you're doing it. You're getting the message out about something that's happening in the work environment. Um, and just the shows, I had an opportunity to look at some of the previous shows uh, that you've done and some of the topics that you've touched on. I think this platform 
What I like most about it is that you do give voice to things that we only talk about in the kitchen or the barber shop or the beauty shop, <laughs> right? And you're giving voice to it and putting faces with it as well. And I think that in a time like we're experiencing right now in history, that is so needed. So I think I helping me means just continuing the work that you're doing and keep bringing this information out here because it's helpful. We learn, but it's also affirming because you're like, oh, okay, it's not just me. It's not just me. <laughs> right? It's it, not just me. This is not just my experience, right? And, and, uh, and I think that that is the beauty of the Black executive perspective. Well, thank you. And we're going to keep doing that. And more importantly, we thank you for coming on to help elevate these stories. So if there's anything else, that part is a done deal because we're going to keep, you know, you know, having people come on, talk about these things, share so we can educate people. But today you educated us. So we want to thank you. And we thank you with a massive amount of love. And at some point, we would love to have you come back again and talk more about Let's Talk. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony. Enjoy the conversation thank, thank you enjoyed it as well so now i think it's time for tony's tidbit so tony's tidbit today is sometimes it's not the people who change it's the mass that fall off and Rhonda spoke about that today right so i hope that you've really enjoyed this episode of a black executive perspective podcast mask off with Rhonda height ceo founder of let's talk and we ask that you tune in to the next episode of a black executive perspective podcast wherever you get your podcast and you can follow us on all our socials of linkedin twitter excuse me x youtube instagram facebook at a black exec for our fabulous guests and my sister from the 313 Rhonda height my producer, the guy in the background that makes all these things work well and, and seamless, double A. I'm Tony Tidbit. We talked about it. I love you, and we're out. A Black Executive Perspective.